There are so many reasons why I am an advocate for getting more wild foods into your life. If you've gotten this far, you know a lot of my philosophies and you know some of the reasons that is. But some of the big ones are, of course, one, feeling more resilient and capable so that you know if the world should go to heck in a handbasket, you have a little bit more capacity to bring in what you need from the landscape around you. So obviously, food security, feeling capable, tending to your own needs, that's huge, and wild foods are a great way to do that. Another super important thing is that being more connected to the wild places around you is going to be good for you in all kinds of ways that are much bigger than just the calories that your body needs to live, right? One of the big focuses of this gathering is connection and how can we connect to these places and how can we feel more a part of the greater world around us? And as we've talked about in some of the plant ID classes, well, knowing how to recognize the patterns in the world, having familiar faces and friends out in the wild world is one way to feel a lot more connected. But let's take it to a deeper level, a cellular level, and back to the old, you know, grade school idiom that you are what you eat. That is completely in every way literally true, right? We are made up of the foods that we take in. We digest, we break apart those foods that we've eaten and we take them apart at a molecular level and we rebuild our cells with them. We build the molecules of our body from the molecules of the wild things that we take in. So there's no better way to be connected to the wild spaces than to be consuming them and building our own human body out of those things. So really, really beautiful. And it doesn't take a lot of wild foods in order to do this, right? Just a little bit of wild foods consumed regularly are going to mean that your body is actually part of that greater landscape. And that is a beautiful thing, both physically and, you know, mentally, emotionally to know. Learning about wild foods is a great way to go deeper into your botany and have practical ways to apply the things you're learning. I mean, you know, I happen to have a passion for botany and so learning a lot about plants just because I love them and care about them is great for me, but that isn't true for everyone. And for a lot of people, we wanna have a reason why. We wanna be able to apply the knowledge that we're gaining. So when you start to learn about wild foods and wild medicines, that's somewhere to go with this information about plant families and different species and that's an amazing thing. Another thing is that wild foods are typically going to be way more nutritious than similar foods that you would buy at a grocery store. And there are a lot of reasons for that. One is that a lot of the soils that our agricultural goods are grown on are really depleted because we've been, you know, growing year after year, harvesting, taking all of those goods off of the land, and then the people who are eating them aren't pooping and giving those nutrients back to the land. We're adding these chemical fertilizers and even in organics, we're adding better fertilizers, but still we're not completely replacing all of those trace minerals that we're removing when we harvest the crops. So when you're eating wild foods, you're eating from soils that are intact, right? That haven't been mined for their nutrients by this constant harvest of green matter that isn't coming back to the soil in some way. So it's actually a fabulous way to get some of those little trace nutrients that you're not getting a lot of other places. They also tend to be much higher in nutritive value and lower in caloric value versus a lot of the foods that we can buy, like, you know, empty fillers, like, like highly refined grains and sugars and that kind of thing. So they've got more nutrition for less calorie density. Now there are some times when calorie density is really important for us, but in general, one of the ills of our society is too much calorie, right? And empty calories without a lot of nutrient. So wild foods are a really wonderful way to boost your nutrient intake and to get yourself used to what it's like to eat those foods that we evolved to eat. So really wonderful health practice to eat more wild foods. So of course, you know, it's really hard to one, teach you everything there is to know about wild foods in a short class, never going to happen. And two, to be able to teach to people from all over the country or the world in one class. So so of course, a lot of the things I'm going to be introducing you to aren't things that you might have access to. But the idea is to begin to build familiarity, think out of the box and think about new ways to use things that you maybe hadn't thought of before, and just to kind of get your brain moving in these ways. So if you happen to live 
on the west coast of the United States, then this might be more applicable to you. But if you don't, don't tune out because some of these things like acorns are really broad spread all across the northern part of the globe. These are in the US. They're all the way from the west coast to the east coast. They're all over Europe, a real traditional food in Europe. So there is a lot of crossover. So introducing you to wild foods, convincing you why you want wild foods. Probably we've already covered some of that. And then uh, showing you some of the ways to process and make use of them. So I'm talking to you from Northern California. And if you look at the landscape behind me, it looks pretty dry and barren, right? And if you've been following the news, you'll know that we had a really hot dry year and you know, we have had massive forest fires and it looks like the land is about done for the year until the rains come, right? It looks like things are kind of tapped out. But even at this time of the year, there's actually amazing abundance of both foods and medicines. But fall can be deceptive because it's often a time of great abundance when things are using all of that wonderful solar radiation that they absorb throughout the season and putting their last oomph into making some fruits and setting some seeds and getting ready to go dormant into the cool dark season by giving that last bit of life to the world in the fall. So even in this dry barren landscape around me right now, I'm seeing two wonderful medicinals, Cyanothus and Yerba Santa, and two wonderful food substances, Manzanita and Oak. So just another invitation to think out of the box and look around and really think about what this season represents because to the other wild creatures on the landscape right now, fall is all about getting as much food as they can, storing up their reserves for the winter, right? So there's actually a tremendous amount of food available right now if you look in the right places. Let's start by just swiveling the camera to introduce you to a lovely friend of mine right over here. This beauty right here is a plant known as manzanita, and a lot of people don't realize this, but the wonderful thing about manzanita is it is Spanish for little apple. And check out these little beauties. They look exactly like a miniature little apple. Manzana is Spanish for apple. Ita or ito is a suffix that is used to mean little. So little apple, literally. Manzanita is the genus Arctostaphylus. And this is a super widespread genus. And it is all the way from down south in California, all the way up north. I had this same genus on the land I was living on in the Northwest Tor Territories when I was on a loan. So super widespread. And Manzanita, is one of those plants that comes in a lot of different forms, but there are no toxic forms of this. So this is a wonderful plant to know because if you live anywhere where it grows, you have a potential abundant harvest of these lovely little fruits. And like so many other plants that put out a big flush of nuts or fruits, they'll often do it in what we call mast years. So this happens to be an amazing year for manzanita. As you can see, these are just absolutely loaded. And one of the beautiful things about manzanita berries is they pretty much dry on the bush. So they're pretty much ready to go from the time you harvest them in the late summer or fall. So these are not, they're, they're tasty, but they are not truly like an apple because they're quite dry and they're, they're pithy and they have pretty good sized seeds in them. So they're, um, Mm. They're really delicious though. They're sweet and they're sour. Super tangy, but um, they have they have these big hard seeds. So you want to make sure that you don't bite down really hard. You could break a tooth. So I like to harvest a bunch of these and then put them through an old fashioned food mill, like the kinds that, that people used to use to make baby food out of or old fashioned way to get the the seeds and the skins off of your tomatoes, or your grapes or such. So the nice thing about the seeds is that they're big enough, they actually won't go through the screen of a food mill often. So you can separate out the seeds and the skin from that, that dry pithy material in the middle. And then you have this lovely powder that some people refer to as manzanita sugar. It's a wonderful topping. You can put it on cooked grain or oatmeal. You can put it in smoothies. I think it would be really, really nice combined with some sweeter fruits like apples for a manzanita apple butter. 
like little apple apple butter. Um, so it's a great wild food that you do need to be a little bit creative to use because it's not like your standard fruit that's sweet and juicy and you just slice it up and use. But it is one of those things that when it's a good year for it, it's super, super abundant. So it's really nice to be able to harvest a bunch and put it up and start to use it in your diet more regularly. Here we have an example of another wonderful wild food in my area, which is one I've mentioned before. It is the nuts of the gray pine. So the nuts are well worked into the very woody, very substantial cones. These cones are like cannonballs. They are super heavy, super pointy with big spikes. They're usually very heavy with pitch and they're so substantial that they're hard for squirrels to get into, which is one of the reasons why we actually get to harvest them ourselves, right? So many wild foods, particularly nuts, the squirrels get to before we can around the fall time. There's a constant sound of squirrels chewing through the hard shell of the black walnuts in my neighborhood. But these suckers are an awesome source of food if you can manage to get them out. It's hard to see, but wedged in here, there is one hard shelled nut for every scale. A lot of them fall out before the cones even drop, but usually there are some in the bottom couple of tiers. And sometimes if you're on the scene quickly, there are a ton of these nuts. So you wanna look under the tree and there will usually be a bunch of old gray cones from prior years. You wanna look for the ones that are still nice and brown and fresh looking. The best way I know to get the nuts is to gather up a bunch of fresh cones, go to a road, and just whack them against the pavement as hard as you can. The nuts come flying out. Like that, very sophisticated techniques for helping yourself to some of this lovely wild food. Once you start paying attention to the wild and seasonally abundant foods around you, it is hard to get anywhere. I am on my way to pick up my computer at the repair shop, but right here I am driving past a magnificent black walnut tree. You can see as the leaves are starting to fall, it's easier to see that this thing is just studded with beautiful black walnuts, which are both a wonderful food source and a wonderful source of dye. We're going to be learning a little bit more about that as we move on through the gathering. Also, you can make lovely buttons with the shells of the black walnut. So wonderful resource. Good to know this one is native to this area, Juglans nigra californica, and wonderful food resource. Also not native, but English walnuts are amazing and a lot easier to process because these, the nut has a, has a very hard shell and the nut itself is surrounded within the hard shell as opposed to the English walnut where it's just hard shell on the outside, but softer than this one. And it's just paper around the nut itself. Still fabulous resource and good to know. So here are the black walnut hulls. So here are the black walnuts themselves. Right now they are surrounded in this thick fleshy hull. This is the source of the dye. As the season goes, these are going to be dropping and then the hull is going to turn from this bright green to a deep dark brown and get softer and easier to push off. And then you can store the hulls long term for your dyeing. And it's also a potent medicine. These are very antibacterial. So you can make a powerful antibiotic with black walnut hull. And some people take it internally. It is a very strong medicine, but it can be used for the treatment of certain parasites because it's so gnarly and strong. So I don't take it internally, but score. It's not a great idea to go filling your clothing with black walnut hulls because it could turn your stuff black, but hopefully these are still intact enough and the shirt is pretty dark. So I think I'm safe. Also, Interesting side note, I got covered in burrs in picking these up. These are one of the plants that I introduce in the wild spring plant walk. This is burr chervil, which is in the carrot family, which is a lovely flavoring, but you want to be careful with it because again, the carrot family has super toxic stuff. So just a little side note and weaving content together here. 
It is a heck of a year for black oaks, which are everywhere all around me. But when I go a little bit further down in elevation, I quickly get into the habitat of these lovely California blue oaks. And they, of course, are having a wonderful year too and give me the opportunity to compare and contrast both the processing and the flavor of the blue oaks versus the black oaks. Now, blue oaks are in the white oak larger group, which means they will probably have less tannins and also have a papery hull that sticks to the shell rather than sticking to the acorns. So I'm excited to try these and see how they compare. And they are everywhere. So check it out. I think right here I have stumbled upon a hybrid of a live oak and a blue oak. Look at how different these long, pointy, dark acorns are from the short, round, brown acorns of what I would typically think of more like the blue oak acorns. So lots of fun experiments to do here. So lots and lots to know about oak. You can really dive into the world of oaks and I definitely would encourage you to cultivate a relationship with them and uh, yeah, start learning how to process your own because as wild foods go, oh my gosh, so delicious, nutritious and abundant, wonderful way to go.